Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a medium-sized business in Silicon Valley. Uh, additionally, I am uh, elected delegate for Bernie Sanders in CD14, California. Previously, I was a financial analyst and a financial journalist and a research engineer in telecommunications. I want to speak to you tonight about uh, the question of whether Bernie Sanders is to endorse Hillary Clinton. Uh, and uh, what he has argued is that we are trying to get the strongest progressive platform possible, and he's bringing 1,900 delegates to Philadelphia. Uh, then on Thursday, he came out the strongest ever, I think, on Charlie Rose and said that we need to get Hillary Clinton elected. So his saying that publicly was a big shocker to me uh, because uh, we haven't finished our work of pushing for this platform. And so the question is, why would we even bother? And the answer is <clears throat> that basically of the Democratic uh, Party establishment that's aligned around Clinton coming to the Sanders campaign and Sanders and saying, look, if you support us, we'll listen to your ideas, we'll adopt some of them, we'll work with you as your ally, uh, but you have to endorse our candidate now um, while we need you. And we don't want pictures of the convention full of riot gear and police. We want to have a coronation, I suppose. Um, although, obviously, we'd all like to see some action in the streets to represent the people's passion. Uh, and the question is, <clears throat> what would be enough for Bernie Sanders to uh, endorse uh, Clinton? That is, for uh, him to symbolically say, I'm acting on the behalf of my supporters here. And... Uh, so these Clinton people are going to say that if he doesn't align with them up to and into the convention, or certainly at least deliver the supporters at the election time, uh, that uh, all of the people that he's working with are going to be given a very hard time in all the power structures of the country. So that instead of having a third, a third, a third in a way, you've got the uh, Republicans, Trump, you've got Clinton, the establishment, you've got Sanders, the anti-establishment, the youth, um, the more progressive uh, wing of the Democratic Party uh, and independents. Uh, and so you've got these three factions. So the question is, at what point do we say it's too little and we can't ally and we have to go uh, to a plan B of some kind? The plan A is we get what we want in the platform. What is plan B? And um, there's a very good uh, piece that I will post here uh, by the man who wrote the book about the Bernie Sanders presidency, literally, where he analyzes what happened to this platform committee. So uh, there was some progress on uh, health care, but not the kind I would consider substantive because it's got to be single payer to cut the cost in half. We pay about eight to 9,000 a year per capita. Other countries pay three to 4,000 a year, get similar, better health care outcomes. Uh, so a uh, public option simply means that we have public providers that essentially have to compete with private providers. So you're going to have an inflated market that people can go to the public door to get services. Uh, but it hasn't been shown to control costs because all those private doors still are able to control the market pricing. So... Um, so at any rate, uh, the other area is the issue of trade, where Trump has been very critical of the TPP and NAFTA, and uh, so was Sanders, and we haven't been able to get any language blocking TPP. Uh, Elizabeth Warren gave a very good piece about this, regardless of whether you like her right now, after she didn't help Bernie when we needed her. It's a good piece. It really describes how the, uh, and it's on YouTube, you can find it, Elizabeth Warren TPP, uh, uh, really describes how this whole thing was written by corporate lobbyists uh, and with no visibility in from the public, and not written for the people, but written for the big corporations. Uh, and we all wonder why Obama is betting his presidency on this uh, nightmarish piece of work. Um, and uh, so uh, then the, but the egregious aspect of this, that we haven't gotten one jot, tittle, or iota of amendment passed on the whole entire subject of foreign policy, which is one of the most disturbing aspects for most people about a Clinton presidency, that she could potentially put us into a greater danger with Russia than Trump would, for example. 
and I personally don't see how we could endorse Clinton as a movement if there's not a jot, tittle, or iota of give on the subject of foreign policy. Um, so what are some examples? Well, there was language calling for uh, American military attack on Iran if Iran does not abide by the nuclear uh, uh, agreement. Um, we tried to remove that and that failed. Uh, there was talk about rebuilding Gaza. Uh, which has been devastated by destruction, and that failed. Uh, we uh, talked about uh, removing language about Syria, and that failed, as far as I understand it. Uh, I'm not 100% certain about Syria, but I do recall hearing something about it. Um, so uh, this is a big problem. So if you agree with me, that it, on various issues, whether it's uh, Hillary's closeness to the uh, big banks uh, and whether she's really willing out to, whether the Democratic uh, uh, people that have assembled themselves around her and her coalition and movement are really willing to take on Wall Street, uh, seems uh, very unlikely. And the question is, is there any plan B at all? And obviously plan B has to be about running and winning even without the support of the Democratic Party. And the only way to justify that is to see that the position of the Democratic Party uh, uh, under Clinton is so severe. The other problem with agreeing to the Clinton camp's uh, pressure tactics to endorse before the convention is that it puts us in a position where we're always on probation with this uh, stronger party that can shut down on us at any time. Uh, for any reason. So if we don't back uh, the Clintonistas uh, later on, they might cut off our access to Congress and uh, being heard, so to speak. So uh, to be told that you'll be given cooperation if you cooperate by a stronger party uh, means that that relationship can end at any time. So on the issue of the third party run, um, it actually looks pretty good for Sanders. So what you have to do is you have to, uh, uh, first of all, in this case, what I've got is the 2008 election and um, Obama, McCain, etc. And um, then here I've been recording the results of the current uh, uh, primary. Uh, so in the case, for example, of California, there was a total of 8.2 million votes for Obama. 5 million for McCain, uh, Sanders got 2381, Clinton got 2745. So then the question is, how do the independents who were locked out of the elections vote? Um, so in this particular case, what I did is I took the ratio that Sanders-Clinton had and assumed we would get that in, uh, we would get at least the turnout we got in the 2008 election, because in this election we're not just going to have Trump and Sanders and Clinton, we'd also have G Gary Johnson, because he's polling at above 10% in some polls. And the uh, if it goes four-way, people are going to be more uninhibited about going to G Gary Johnson from Trump. So the whole thing is complicated. Uh, so to do a simulation, uh, here we've got the, uh, the amount for Sanders and Clinton, and other Democrats, this is a total in the primary for California, which is incorrectly stated everywhere. You have to go to Secretary of State office because of our lazy press, not updating the post-election results. Uh, then we've got Trump, we've got Cruz. Uh, so what you see here is that Clinton could defeat Trump as well as Sanders. Um, so it's not a danger for Sanders to run here to Clinton because they both beat Trump, but let's look a little deeper. So in addition to Trump, there was Cruz and Kasich, but even with all of that added, the Republicans voted less than either Sanders or Clinton. So this is a safe state to run against Clinton in. Uh, by, if Sanders wins, it doesn't affect her order. She's second. If Sanders doesn't run, she would be first. So there's no nadir effect. <clears throat> but it depends on how you parse it. 
Uh, so the, uh, I haven't done a big analysis yet, but independents only showed up at five to ten percent in the in the election because in California, independents are going to break heavily towards Sanders, not towards Trump, in my opinion. Um, and I can back that up because if they were going to go to Trump, well, it was closed here actually. So uh, you don't have to get it all right at every single percentage point everywhere, though. Uh, there's an overall trend that shows up. So we've got uh, these votes here for uh, Clinton and Sanders. Uh, then we've got the Republicans and we've got the turnout. So it'd have to multiply by 55% the results we got in the primary to represent the same amount of votes Obama got in the general. And for the Republicans, they got twice the turnout with McCain in 2008 than they got in the primary here. And that's partly because the general is open uh, the, the independents make up more than either Democrats or Republicans. Independents are, uh, let's see here, independents I think are 30, oh, I've got the figure here somewhere. I think they're 35 percent, Democrats are 30 percent, and Republicans are 25 percent, something along those lines. Uh, so at any rate, <clears throat> Then you've got your, uh, here's my projection for Sanders, which is based on his vote base times the turnout, uh, times uh, leading off more support by 15% from the added voters than does Clinton, who I give a 15% a, a handicap to. So I do, uh, for, so the votes above and beyond their adjusted base I give Sanders an advantage because they're mainly going to be independent. So that's the tr tricky part. Um, and that's where I show him winning uh, in a three way, 4 million to 3, uh, 4 million 700,000 to 3 million 800,000, with Trump at 2 million 450,000. But even if he hit 4 million, which is McCain's number, uh, which I don't think he would. So the question is uh, who steals which votes from who? So. Uh, you've got to analyze all the voters in the primaries. We all agree on this. Most of those people will stay with them in the general, but there are all these complicated cross effects, which I will touch upon uh, briefly. But obviously Sanders is going to run much stronger in a general than he does in a primary because his primary power base is independents, not Democrats. And he's going to pull the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. He's going to pull at these two edges. A certain number of Trump voters, uh, of Republican voters, are going to de uh, defect to Sanders because Trump is such an unusual uh, character. And a certain number of Republicans will defect over to Clinton uh, because she is a, 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 actually the person of the establishment of Wall Street. Um, so you get all these different crossover effects. How many of the Kasich voters will go to Trump? How many will go to Clinton? And then you have to handicap those by will they be less, will they be demoralized because they're, uh, uh, they're primary guy they voted for, like they voted for Cruz in the primary. Do you give a 10% handicap for them showing up to vote for Trump or Clinton? In the, uh, and if they cross over, does that increase their likelihood of showing up or decrease it? So. There's all these questions, but you model these core populations. And so what you've got here, just real briefly in my model, here's the California result uh, where Clinton would win handily over Trump almost three to one in this simulation. Um, and then uh, we have here in uh, Colorado, I have uh, Sanders winning. She, he won handily in Colorado in the caucuses. Uh, so uh, I have him. Uh, beating uh, Trump 850,000 to 650,000 with Clinton pulling in 437. And if we look over here, uh, historically McCain got a million votes. So if I'm wrong, um, that would be a problem. But they're all sort of, you have to look at the overall pattern. Now here on the other hand in Florida, according to my calculations, uh, according to my calculations, Clinton would win without Sanders because he'd get 50% of his votes. Uh, and uh, so she would get uh, three million and a half. Is that really possible? Yes, because uh, Obama got four and uh, two. So 
Uh, Florida would uh, rob, this would rob her of Florida. I have him winning, um, yeah, with Trump winning instead. So this is, uh, Florida is a state he might not want to run, he might want to withdraw at the last minute because we can pool electors. We can at the last minute, if we have a, uh, no one party has enough electors to be president, two parties could pool their electors so that it doesn't go to the, the new House of Representatives to be decided, which is very unlikely to be democratic. But if uh, Bernie gets in the race, uh, anything could happen. Um, it would be very interesting to see the kind of weird coattails that two different uh, challengers would bring on election night of people who, uh, candidates who were uh, benefited down ballot from Sanders and candidates who vet, benefited down ballot from Clinton and so forth. So this gets to the final part. So the, the existential question is if we uh, get no concession whatsoever in foreign policy, let's think about that for a minute and let's also think about this. There is only one law of the people. Only one in dictator's will. And he does not share power. So that's the question is will the Dark Lord share power? So what I want to conclude on, uh, let's see, so analyzing the third party run, it does look quite good for him. Um, and uh, you model these core populations of the original uh, voters from the primaries, you figure out who's going to enter, what the turnout targets are, and Sanders has a very strong possibility of uh, certainly being able to pool electors with Clinton uh, to defeat Trump at the last minute if necessary. So there is a plan B available, and I want everyone to know that, and I've been pretty accurate. I got it I got it wrong. I thought Bernie would get the majority of pledged delegates at a certain point in this race, uh, just before West Virginia, I think, and after uh, Michigan. Um, and um, there was a lot of problems in the election in Puerto Rico and in Arizona, New York, uh, Massachusetts, exit polls not matching. Um, in California, we have tossed out more provisionals than are the difference between Sanders and Clinton, uh, but uh, uh, it's really difficult to say. I mean, I don't see any Clinton uh, signs anywhere. I see Sanders signs all over the place, uh, yet he just barely ties her or loses to her in San Mateo County. Um, a lot of this is because of confusion with the independents and so forth. What the Dems are going to say, so the question is, do we move, work inside the movement or outside of them? Uh, do we work inside the system or outside of the system? What the Dems are going to say is, without us, your progressive movement will not see the light of day in Congress. But if you help us now, we will continue to listen to your ideas. Uh, that is to humor us. The problem with this is that what happens when they go so far away from our core principles that we have to break with them. If it's something that is important to them, they might not give us a hearing anymore. So we can never win with the cooperate and things will uh, be better for you. Have these types of situations ever worked out? Well, to some extent, yes, as Bernie likes to analyze the women's movement, labor movement, and so forth. Eventually, some kind of centrist party moves uh, towards the radical people in the street and introduces a softened part of what they want. But maybe later, they, what was radical becomes mainstream, as he likes to say. And how is it that we've come down to this? A well-meaning and intelligent buffoon, to be as uh, diplomatic as possible to Mr. Trump, versus a war criminal, and someone clearly deeply enmeshed with every problematic and toxic special interest group possible. The ultra-conservative ideological cousins of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, that is Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the Gulf Petro monarchies. The hardcore white ring interests of the Likud party in Israel were her one of our number one contributors uh, is, uh, he's a Univision guy who uh, is ultra hawkish on Israel. Her, her connections to Goldman Sachs 
to the extent that its CEO Lloyd Blankfein personally endorsed an investment fund that was set up to be run by Chelsea Clinton's husband, an unheard of level of endorsement. A uh, CEO of Goldman writing such an endorsement of a small new investment fund, which ended up losing a lot of money. Um, on the now, as far as Clinton goes in foreign policy, on the war crimes side, the policies Clinton has supported are chilling. The Iraq War, the failed policies in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, the drone campaign, uh, which Obama is up to his eyeballs in as well, the aiding and abetting and deploying of about 100,000 mercenary jihadists into Syria. Uh, so we, uh, uh, so the Clinton Foundation took over $10 million. Its main contributors were the Gulf Petromonarchies. We at the same time sold the record level of weapons we've ever sold to that area of the world. At the same time, $155 billion worth of weapons. It's an astonishing number. Normal exports a year used to be 10, 20 billion, according to this uh, Swedish group that monitors international arms transfers. So I think it's called CIPRI. So, um, so uh, there's a big Saudi army of about 50,000 people funded and trained and deployed and paid salaries by Saudi Arabia there. There's also about half that size uh, being supported by other states from out of the region, especially Turkey. And because Turkey's funding a proxy army in Syria, they're nice to ISIS because ISIS is also fighting Assad. So the better ISIS does, the better chance they have to, uh, to win uh, uh, in Syria. Uh, so there's a perverse incentive for the Turks to help ISIS. Um, and ISIS is, is a belligerent against Assad as well. Clinton has pushed hard to accelerate this foreign intervention-fueled civil war. Uh, it is a height of irony that newscasters blame Assad, who is far from blameless, for the entire death toll. Even though the highest fatalities have fallen on his own minority Alawite community, where one in four of all army-aged males have, are, have died already fighting. Uh, so, you know, of these 400,000 who died there, a good 100,000 were in the army and, uh, and uh, the Alawites. Even though the highest fatalities have fallen on his community, killing of a quarter of the... Uh, yeah. If the U.S. had been steadfast about maintaining strict uh, arms transfer controls, uh, for our transfers over to these countries and into Syria. Syria would have been rescued from the abyss to the political quagmire, but out of the killing fields long ago. Russia stepped in twice in Syria. Another outrage of the press and the political orthodoxy, of which affects even some relatively anti-war journalists and politicians, to repeat this false narrative. That is, that the Syrian government was responsible for the sarin gas attack at Gota, the suburb of Damascus. In fact, it's likely this was homemade sarin. It doesn't match the signature of the sarin of the military stocks of the Syrians. Uh, and uh, that we do know that there was a busted sarin tr transport and trade going on across the Turkish border that was exposed and documented. Uh, and Seymour Hersh, or Cy Hersh, who's a great American journalist who exposed my lie in Vietnam, uh, will vouch for the fact that this sarin was probably not from the Syrian government, but it's produced to this day as in a matter of fact manner, uh, as if saying it makes it true. Uh, the, here the Russians negotiated the removal of all sarin gas stocks, stopped Obama from having to start bombing, and uh, caused a nice little spike in the stock of the company that makes the uh, uh, missiles we were going to bring down on them. I don't know if they were patriots or what. Uh, but I think it was uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, Russia stepped in twice. Another, okay, so that was a gas attack. Then, of course, they stepped in to prevent the caliphate, that is, Daesh, the new state of Iraq and Syria, or what do we in the West call ISIS. At any rate, the Russians stepped in to prevent the caliphate from flying its flag over the capital of Syria, Damascus. Now, the U.S. and NATO, whose combined armed expenditures amount to over $1.2 trillion a year, have become thrice alarmed at Russia recently and have begun beating the drums that we need to warn of their imminent attack on Europe. Russia, with a defense budget that's less than 5% of NATO's, is considered a renewed existential threat. This leads us to Hillary Clinton getting it completely wrong on the Ukraine. 
The roots were the USSR, this Union of Soviet Socialist Republics agreement to allow the reunification of Germany with a guarantee of no eastward expansion of their Cold War nemesis. No eastward expansion of their Cold War nemesis. NATO in 1990, uh, Germany reunified entered NATO in 1990. For nine years, there was no expansion. All the years of Clinton, at the end of the Clinton administration, uh, we against our assurances to Russia that there would be no eastward expansion of NATO if they permitted our uh, reunification of Germany as they occupied Germany. They had to physically, uh, gradually leave it as it converted to a NATO country. For nine years, there was no expansion. Then in 99, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary joined. Then, in 2004, all of the former Eastern European Warsaw Pact nations that used to border the USSR converted to NATO. Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Romania, Bulgaria. Every country in Europe had become NATO that, that had wished to at that point, except a couple of countries in the former Yugoslavia, such as Serbia. So, this was the original grievance for the Russians, uh, that it was absolutely a non-possibility for part of their historic lands to uh, become a NATO country. It would be like our allowing Texas to become part of China. The second outrage uh, was that when the Ukraine was negotiating with Europe a more favorable trading relationship with the EU, the EU required it to make a military agreement, uh, in effect uh, drawing uh, Ukraine closer to the NATO orbit, as well as requiring that it not be part of a three-way talk with Russia. Because if Ukraine was flooded with cheap goods from Europe, uh, it had the potential of raising Russia's food costs tremendously, because Russia bought most of its food from Ukraine. You have to look historically uh, here, uh, but the main point is that the EU arrogantly refused to allow a three-way talk with Russia, setting a stage for a huge schism in the Ukraine. So the Ukraine is traditionally drawn into two parts, east of the Dnieper River and west of the Dnieper River, which is, uh, 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 so that the east side is mainly ethnically Russian. And if we look at a map of Europe, um, so the traditional Europe of around 1800 AD, you see there is no, poor Poland is completely gone in this map. It's just Prussia, Austria, Hungarians, and the uh, empire of uh, the Russias, as they call it here. And if you look at this border of Russia and you compare it to the current border, it pretty much covers the Ukraine and Belarus. So these are historically uh, Russian lands. And in fact, the uh, original Kievan principality that expanded to become the Duchy of Moscow uh, was uh, based in Kiev. But uh, this is in Western Ukraine. There's an ethnic group of Slavs living in the Ukraine called Ukrainians, but there are also many other ethnic groups. And uh, many of the people on the east bank of this river that splits the country in half are aligned and orientated towards Russia. And that's exactly what's happened. Uh, so this caused a schism in the country. And what the U.S. did is uh, we uh, were ready to roll as soon as uh, the demonstrations came out. Um, <clears throat> So Ukraine literally means borderland in um, uh, in uh, Ukrainian, Ukraina. Uh, it's not a historical country. It is where the Poles, the Lithuanians, the Tatars, the Cossacks, the Russians all jostled for influence. It's east, historically aligned towards Russia. When protests broke out in Kiev in the Ukraine, Western agencies were busily at work. Our playbook is used to use local heavies, anti-government, uh, militias to destabilize our opponents, whether in Libya, where we used Al Qaeda types, the Libya Islamic Fighting Group, uh, or whether in Ukraine, where we used uh, groups that uh, hearkened their allegiances back to old Ukrainian SS battalions uh, because they fought the Russians. 
uh, on behalf of the Nazis, but uh, these people, uh, which are in Svoboda, uh, uh, and uh, Pravi Sector, or Navi Sector, which means right sector, uh, these are, are skinhead types. Uh, they are thugs, and they were exposed by German television to be the ones responsible for shooting the protesters. And uh, so we've aligned ourselves with uh, uh, openly uh, Nazi-affiliated groups in the Ukraine. Uh, uh, John McCain's been seen posing next to these men. These are very serious matters. Uh, and uh, Clinton has been on the wrong side of this, especially with her confidence in Victoria Newland, who I think has a husband who is one of these... Uh, neoconservatives, I think Kagan is her husband, and uh, uh, Newland uh, uh, has displayed a remarkable lack of sensitivity to the Russian position. So I'm very concerned Clinton could uh, accelerate conflict in Syria, accelerate conflict with Russia. Uh, she said she hasn't given up on Libya. Uh, so Hillary uh, is uh, feared and loathed by Libyans even more than Gaddafi, because they really did destroy Libya. And they took what could have been a internal, largely peaceful struggle, revolution, and rapidly militarized it, put it in the hands of Al-Qaeda types, and then began bombing the country, making all the tribes switch to, from being in rebellion into actually backing up Gaddafi, the main tribe, the Warfala, switch when we started bombing. Uh, uh, so Hillary, uh, the Gaddafis are busy on the phone dialing all their friends that they had been whining and dining with as they'd been brought in from the cold. They'd disarmed uh, uh, with Bush. They'd given up their weapon stocks in 2004 for improved relations. Uh, they were, uh, and so they were frantically calling on their phone all their so-called friends who'd now forgotten about them. And uh, Clinton just bombed the shit out of them. Uh, uh, she claims that she's glad that 1,500 died instead of 100,000. This is just ugly, ugly lie uh, that 1,500 people died in Libya. No one suspects that it was less than 20 to 40,000. Anyone who knows about Libya will give you that number. So she took a number that you can find on Wikipedia, which is the number, because NATO refused to do a death count at the end of the war. Uh, and it was inconvenient for the people who took over Libya to have any records of their crime. Basically, the war, want, they want to cover it up. Uh, I could do a whole segment just on why no one in Libya wants anyone to remember what happened during that war. Because Libya is worth a lot of money, and uh, there is a potential of a uh, you know, $100 billion investment fund falling in the hands of Al-Qaeda if it hasn't already, effectively, the Libyan investment fund. Um, so, uh, so you know, Hillary uh, uh, bombed that country to the Stone Age. There were 8,900 attacks. Uh, uh, Obama wasn't uh, really eager to bomb Libya. Uh, and she says she hasn't given up on it. It's like somebody who beats their wife daily, and then somebody says, how's it going? And they go, oh, well, I haven't given up on her. You know, I think with a few more beatings, she might shape up. Uh, it's just unbelievable that she can say a, a person who is so hated in Libya now um, could say, I haven't given up on Libya, uh, who immediately abandoned it when her uh, uh, people that she thought we had helped turned on her, in her opinion, by killing the people in Benghazi. But no, none of us wanted her to hang out with those guys, and they were no friends of uh, the Libya that was completely safe to visit and trade with up until you got involved. Uh, so. You know, if you go through all of Hillary Clinton's foreign policy positions, or, or uh, you know, the, uh, the deal with the TPP is basically a deal to try to uh, throttle China by giving U.S. corporations greater access into Asian markets. So, on a uh, global realpolitik thing, it maybe uh, it makes sense, but. Uh, you know, we don't need these policies. We need to have a, a to to uh, help Syria achieve peace, even if that means helping uh, prop up their government. Um, the country is almost permanently destroyed. Uh, that country was a a great China, uh, where uh, like a great uh, uh, warehouse full of China, rare uh, minority groups rare buildings, rare cities, ancient, ancient things that have all been bombed to smithereens. So, uh, and what wasn't bombed unintentionally, uh, the most greatest uh, uh, ancient world site, perhaps in the world, Palmyra, was deliberately 
detonated by ISIS uh, uh, because it's a UNESCO site and they delight in uh, vandalizing things that the uh, West uh, uh, treasures uh, that are non-Islamic. Uh, so that's really it for tonight. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, I guess the concluding point is there has to be some line at which we won't go further than a bending uh, and I believe that this issue about foreign policy is the line in the sand for me. Uh, so at any rate, uh, my name is Alexander Hagen. Thank you for listening. Good night and good luck.